Here we go. Oh, we see you, SJ. Oh, you changed. Come on. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Okay. Can you see and uh, can you can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Right, great. 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 Thank you. And good morning again. Uh, this is the case of saw the ones from the Asa Medical Center. Actually, we have prepared some uh, Belvin Bell cases. Uh, not many cases, uh, it, 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 to be uh, frankly. Uh, however, uh, I'm very happy and very comfortable to have uh, David Cohen is here, my uh, old friend. Where, where, where is Camila? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I can't find myself. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, heart. Cohen is there. And Dr. Gang and Dr. Bach is your fellows. All right, would we'll, we'll you start the case presentation first? Okay, yeah. Dr. Gang. Yes, the patient is uh, very old. 86-year gentleman admitted for dysmia. He had a history of AVR, aortic valve replacement for bicuspid AS with Carpenter Edward Perimount 23 millimeter valve in 2006 when he was 73. His echocardiography showed severe aortic regurgitation due to frame motion of the biophoretic valve. Uh, the Transesophageal echocardiography showed the flare motion of the left, the left side by prosthetic uh, cusp. Uh, he doesn't have any other medical history, uh, excepting for the chronic kidney disease. Next. And his STS mortality score was 14.3%, very high surgical risk patient. And next. And the echocardiography showed normal ejection fraction, and transaortic valve VMAX was 3.6 and severe ALT regurgitation. And mm -hmm. the EKG showed normal sinus rhythm with mm -hmm. second degree AV block with, uh, with type, Movich type one. Mm -hmm. And next, this is his EKG, shows type uh, second degree AV block, next. And chest X-ray shows the, that the heart size is not so big, that means the, acute mm -hmm. the patient uh, experienced the acute ALT regurgitation, next. And this is the shape of the C, perimount to 23 millimeter valve. True inner diameter is 22, and the height of the valve is 60 millimeter. It is uh, made from the bovine pericardium, mounted on a flexible frame. Next. This is the uh, great image from the Vinibapas application. And the C, C perimount to 23 millimeter valve is comfortable with Sapiens 3 23 meter valve or Evolute Pro or R26 millimeter. Uh, th the, it is recommended to put the S3 in line or just below the lowest visible margin of the perimount valve. Mm -hmm. Next, uh, we also evaluated the, the patient's CT image ourselves and the valve inner short diameter was 19.6 uh, millimeter and long diameter was 24 and the inner mean diameter was 21.9 millimeter and inner mm -hmm. area was 350. Okay. Next. And you can see that the size of the science file server and ST junction is very large because the patient was, uh, had the bicuspid aortic valve. Mm -hmm. Next. And also the LVOT uh, shows clean uh, and the size is enough. Next. And you can see the coronary okay. height is more than 14 millimeter, very high. Next. And there was no significant disease in the thoracic aorta. And next, mm -hmm. and little femoral arteries. Next, this is the uh, size chart derived from the CT image. Mm -hmm. Area uh, oversizing wise, if we choose the 23 second three, it's a 15 percent yeah. area oversizing. I think it's more, you know, comfortable. It will, uh, about, did you see the angiogram over there? Yep. All right. So we yeah. our uh, professor came so from. Uh, all right. Uh, will give us some echocardiographic findings uh, before. Yeah, uh, this is him. Uh, can you see the echo image right now? Uh, this is the past long axis view. Uh, you can see your bioprocessed valve right here. In magnified view. In color flow image, you can see a big pizza right here and eccentric ARZ here. Uh, according to the, the pizza size, uh, it, it indicates of uh, uh, severe AR. 
in show text image, uh, we, uh, I'm not sure which one is flare replay because this is a trans image. Uh, the previous report from the T report uh, sh uh, shows the left co uh, coronary cause uh, was flare. The jet right here indicate of uh, flare motion of left coronary cause. In APK view, uh, every function looks good. Left ventricle is enlarged. Moderate degree of function MR was noted right here. Mm -hmm. In APK view, uh, in color flow image, you can see a severe aortic regression jet right here. OK. Thank you. All right, if you look at the, you know, root angiogram, there's a very severe aortic regurgitation and very big sinus and a little bit dilated aorta, ascending aorta, et cetera, et cetera. This, these findings are typical, as a little bit typical, you know, characteristics of a bicuspid, um, you know, aortic uh, valve here. And anyway, 23 carpenter Edward. So we're going to choose the SS3 CPM for fix uh, the degenerative, uh, you know, valve, aortic uh, regurgitation mania. So I, I would discuss with uh, David. Oh, David, what do you think is 20, 23 and 20, uh, for the 23 carpenter or the 23 CPM3 is quite, a, quite I yeah. think, I mean, I think you could use either um, in this case. Uh -huh. The, uh, I mean, there's plenty of, you know, again, there's, you could use a 26 uh, core valve also, but I don't think you have to, you know, you have to, as you know, uh, we prefer to use a, a core valve if we have small annuli, mm -hmm. um, a small diameter uh, prosthetic valve because you do get um, pretty consistently a larger valve area, although again, if you fracture, mm -hmm. which we won't be doing in this case, mm -hmm. uh, you can get it bigger. So I think a 23 S3 is just, you know, just fine here. The one thing I would just comment on, I don't, it's not a question here, is when you do have a valve that the predominant failure mode is regurgitation, Mm -hmm. um, it is, I think, important to do a TE beforehand to make sure it's not a, a paravalvular. I think that was done uh, in mm -hmm. this case because we've mm -hmm. sometimes uh, been fooled uh, uh, and uh, we, we, we treat for central uh, mm -hmm. regurgitation and it turns out uh, we needed to plug a, a, a PVL. So I think that's important when it's, when it's aortic regurgitation, just to be sure. I think it's not, not much of a question in this case. So that's, All but right. I, think, yeah, I think this is a very nice, Good case for uh, uh, for an S3, and I think the, again the goal, like we were talking about beforehand, is to get the valve just a millimeter or so below the level of the uh, the ring uh, sure. on this uh, on, on on this valve. Right. Thank you. All right. I have another you know discussion point in terms of uh, uh, you know bioprosthetic fracture concern. If uh, you uh, mentioned about it after the you know uh, fix up the device and. Uh, measure the trans uh, gradient, yeah. available gradient. If it's not acceptable, you want to do the, you know? I think, I mean, again, it's, this is a big valve. This is a 23. Mm -hmm. like, right, I, when, I think when we were talking about it, I thought for some reason right. it was a 21, which is the next case. Uh, yep. But, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, this valve can be fractured if you needed to. Um, yeah. We could do it with, a, you know, with, a, with an mm. S3 because you could put a, you know, a 23 or a 20, right. you know, millimeter uh, balloon in there uh, and, fr and fracture right. it and get a little bit larger. But I don't, I don't right. think it will be necessary. There is one point, though, which is, mm. um, at least in the United States, we have two different Car Carpentier Edwards valves. We have some that look like this, which looks like a magna, and it has that perforated mm. strip on the bottom. Mm. Um, there are other Carpentier Edwards valves that don't have that, that perforated strip. Mm. Those are not fracturable. Um, you can bend them. You can bend mm. the frame, and you can reduce the gradient that way, but you can't actually fracture them, so it's important mm -hmm. to make sure which one it is when you have a Carp Carpentier Edwards. It's this uh, one is fractured. All right. Uh, what I have a concern is, you know, uh, last, uh, I've discussed with the Billy Pop Pop. Uh, he uh, and, uh, mentioned about you know pre device you know deployment. Yeah. He did a pre, pre bio press yeah bio uh, press valve fractures. You did we do post yeah, yeah a post uh, you know bio press fractures. However, a little concern about uh, this morning is I've shown uh, you know I've saw the cases you know after the post balloon S3 is a little bit you know. Uh, one says two says more, and two times the post balloony large, you know, uh, valve destruction related aortic valve regurgitation, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm uh, really concerned about the high pressure inflation after the. I mean, you we, know? we haven't seen any problems with post dilating the S3 aggressively. Mm. We have seen one case with a um, with a core valve mm -hmm. where the balloon got a little bit too high up to where the where it was mm -hmm. con the constrained part of the core mm -hmm. valve, and that that did. did tear the core valve and we had to put an extra valve in mm -hmm. uh, in that case. So it can happen. Um, it's certainly 
you know, I mean, some, it, it's certainly safer from rep, you know, damaging the valve to fracture mm. first. The problem, you know, is that you may have to, you know, if you, if you damage the valve, the, the existing surgical valve, you may have to rush because they may develop, mm -hmm. you know, acute severe aortic regurgitation and then you have, you're, you're moving quickly. So you have to balance those two. Our, uh, we have not had problems except for that one case with the core valve that I said, which was sure. our own case, right. um, of damaging the valve. So that's not been an issue, but mm -hmm. it can be an issue and it's certainly something to, to think about. So, the, uh, well, so, what, so what, SJ, what, what just, so, so with, with, with this particular valve, you're <clears throat> my understanding is you're planning uh, the, the S3 on, on this valve. You do not plan a cracking. Uh, it will be a probably and hopefully a pretty straightforward a, um, valve and valve. Is that correct? Yep. So, would you... Okay. That's the big hope. That's the hope. There's, uh, anyways, I have a little concern about, uh, you know, you want to show the hemodynamics, the hemodynamics fractures uh, after the, uh, you know, the uh, device placement. So, however, I, uh, I think it's a, a particular this case is we don't need a, you know, post dilation as opposed to high pressure. Should be fine. Right. Mm -hmm. So, fine. well, I don't. Pro procedure wise. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. About your turn. You know, I never, I, and I don't want to be destructive, but. <laughs> Uh, and I understand, uh, you know, the technique. I understand the the, ne the necessity to uh, to not leave a patient with a gradient, and obviously uh, David and, and others work. Mm -hmm. But I, I never quite understood why, when you have a bioprosthetic valve that's regenerated and you do a valve and valve, uh, you don't know beforehand. I mean, unless in, in the in most of the cases, you do know. <clears throat> if you have a um, if, if you have a good gradient or if you have something that you need to correct um, I'm, I never understood why you would be doing a cracking before you know exactly what the valve and valve implant uh, hemodynamic is yeah and we had a very heated discussion uh, <laughs> recently um, a, a, about this approach because uh, yes it is it is an approach but it is a fairly aggressive approach it is a fairly new approach we don't know the long-term outcomes of these things so unless you you need to do it in order to lower the gradient um, why would you do it ever heard okay but now we I, concentrate yeah, on the I mean, valve deployment obviously we'll, we'll talk about that after I think it's a great question I think it would be a yeah, yeah yeah of course all right uh, push it push it back down uh, to and I want to make it a little bit further for actual concerns. I think it's good. Yeah, so just, yeah. Test a little lower. Right, I think I go in a little bit. Okay, test it. Test it. All right, we, we don't need that once. Uh, so, what do you think, Tabeth? I think it's good. I think it's good. I think he just goes very slowly and. Be prepared to push it in a little bit. If you, oh, no, it's already I, gone I, in a little. I want to make a little bit further coaxial concern like okay. this. All right, that's good. Good. And depth-wise, is good. Okay. I think pull your pigtail back. What maybe? do you think? A bit, pigtail back a little bit. That. And that. And so we don't need it. Okay. Yeah. I think it's great. Great position. Yep. Just go slow. I want to make it a little bit further coaxial concern like this, right? Is more comfortable? Good. All right, good. And, okay. So, pacing on. Okay. Inflate. Nice. Four, five. One, oh, nice, nice. two, three, four, five. <laughs> Deflate. Okay. Why in this pacing off? Um, I think it position wise is very good. That looks right? great. Uh, <coughs> tail. We don't it have uh, intracardiac echo here. So <laughs> <laughs> right, just a tr echo. Oh, yeah. really? All yeah. right. Uh, Dr. Kim is here. Uh, Professor Kim is who? What do you think? Echocardiogram? I mean, you uh, can see the LVD, I mean, his uh, aortic diastolic pressure, which was about 30, is now mm -hmm. about 50. That looks good. All right. Changes. Aortic, aortic. Central AR. 
Central? Central yeah, wire tester. Wire deleted, right? Yeah, yeah. Find okay. Out. Okay, so why not? Uh, I, I moved to AP Kalimichi. Okay. Here is more clear. And then I want to take a picture first. Pull the out, wires further. I want to make it, you know. I don't want to tension like that. Okay, here, yeah. full shot. So Ooh. something, but hopefully that's just wire. Mainly, <laughs> mainly wire related, right? So put the pigtail and then see if, it, see if it goes away. All right. Get hemos too. All right, so pull the procedure wire, I think it's very straightforward. And and uh, I want to measure the pressure using the pigtail in the LV. OK. Good. Pigtail, please. So I see something you don't usually see, which is the patient has a bundle now. They didn't mm -hmm. have. Don't usually see that with valve and valve. Okay. No, no. Okay. Pressure. Lewis. So hemos look much better. No difference. Yeah, I'm just looking at the looking mm. at the diastolic mostly for me. Diastolic is good. So we have. You guys see the hemodynamics, Everhart? Yeah, in echocardiography, yes. the peak pressure is the two point. So. Mm -hmm. so the LVDP, which was about 25 or so, is now uh, 12. Peak pressure gradient to 15 no millimeter. No significant gradient, I didn't In see. Echo. How is it? Should we, we check the AAR now? Okay. Could, could you show us that? Oh, OK. Simultaneous pressure. So very, you know, very small, Different trivial gradient. Right. Maybe less than five, something. And the diastolic uh, pressure is looks fantastic. Is almost normalized. How is the uh, how is the echo now? Is the uh, is the, the AI gone? Pressure gone? Uh, no, press no, AR. no AR. Yeah. Okay, uh, I would like uh, I want to pull back the pigtails from the LV. Okay. Uh, all right. What do you think? It's almost uh, almost the same. Okay. Let's look at the echo. Uh, the echo looks great. No AR yeah, now. Great. No oh. AR. No right AR. Here. Perfect right. SJ. And I want to Hard to beat it. Here. Air to ground again. OK. Maybe come down a little. Right. Just a little bit. Contrast. Uh. OK. Oh, even all right. So, injection. Ah, ooh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Good. Oh, I think it's okay. All right. All right. Very, very nice. Good. Yes, right, very, right, very nice. Right, right. The uh, Good. so it's it's a piece of cake. That's the that's the all beauty right. of a valve and valve taver. Is so it position wise is good, and um, you know oh, I think it's great. is good. Uh, any, any discussion point is there? Well. Do you want to talk a little bit? I can now talk about uh, Eberhard's question about. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the deciding. So I think you're, uh, I mean, the point you were talking about before we started was a good mm -hmm. one. Um, good and it really on. is one of the advantages of doing the valve fracture last is you get, you get to decide if you actually need to. Um, and I think that's, I, I mean, I, I really, you know, we, that's the way we've always practi practiced. Mm -hmm. And I think Eberhard raises great points, which is, you know, we don't know the long-term natural mm -hmm. history of these mm -hmm. fractured mm -hmm. valves and, um, and whether, you know, dilating very aggressively damages mm -hmm. the leaflets and they don't last as long. We have a lot of things we still need to learn about it. We know they work acutely. We know they're generally safe, but even, you know, but they're not perfectly safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's important when you have something that's, you don't know the long-term outcomes and it's not perfectly safe to make sure you need it, you know how to do it and you need, you need mm -hmm. to do it. So I, I think Everhart, I think you raise a lot of good points. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of the reasons why we continue to do it that way. Sure. So David, David and SJ, I, I, I think um, uh, as, as far as the, the, the valve selection is concerned, wouldn't you agree, at least in theory, 
and in fact for me in practice, the smaller the valve, the higher obviously, the higher the probability, I mean the surgical valve, the smaller the surgical valve, the higher the probability of, of post uh slash cracking, mm -hmm. um, and the smaller valves, um, the better the, you use a, 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 um, a self-expanding yeah. superannular device. Is that so, in general true? I would say first, for sure, the smaller the valve, the more likelihood you're going to have an unacceptable gradient and feel like you need to do something to fracture it. Again, the dividing point, at least in the United States, seems to be around 20. If the, if the ID of the valve, the true ID, is less than 20, then uh, there's a high likelihood you'll want to fracture it. In this case, this is a 23 surgical valve with a 21 ID, so it would be very unlikely we would need to fracture, but I think that is true. Whether the self-expanding versus the uh, balloon expandable, that's a little more debatable. I, certainly for many years, we also um, believe that. It's, it's, it's easier to get a low gradient with a self-expanding valve, and if you use a self-expanding valve, super annular, um, you, will, you may obviate the need for some cases of fracturing because, again, it's super annular. Um, what we have found recently, and we published this uh, last year or early this year, I can't remember which, uh, in one of the surgical journals, I think the, uh, um, uh, 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 I actually can't remember which one, but any one of the surgical journals, uh, we, yeah, as our series has expanded, we've been able to look at it more carefully, and again, one of the nice things about it in the United States is there's so many different ways of doing it, so we kind of have a little mini randomized trial of all the different techniques, and uh, what we have seen there is yeah. if you fracture the valves, we can generally get very similar final gradients with a balloon expandable as with a, uh, uh, a core valve. So the advantage of the core valve yeah. um, with the small annuli tends to go down if you fracture because you can kind of overcome it, but you might not have to fracture if you use a core valve in the first place. All right. Yeah, Jen, Jen Wang, you know, Professor Wang is here, obviously. He's got a lo lot of experience. I'm wondering, Jen, what, what's your experience? What would you do in this case? So actually, uh, we don't have much experience about the uh, oh, wow. expandable device. So the for self expanding, I, I I think for this kind of patient, uh, if just a regurgitation, so I I don't think we uh, usually we just uh, the very important to to make make to make decision how to select the size of the device. Uh, actually, uh, very important to have a good evaluation of the CT scan. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't have much experience about balloon expandable device for this kind of patient. Yeah, so, so you would be using a, a Venus or a... Should be okay. Yeah. Should be okay. It's not a very challengeable case. Actually, I just asked uh, SGS, uh, so what, uh, what is the good uh, uh, X-ray uh, projection angle when you, when you deploy the device? So how do you uh, use all the... All right. Anyway, uh, how, uh, good to see you, Dr. Wang. Thank you for coming. Uh, so that's <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> In terms of you know, angle concerns, we uh, prefer horizontal lines, so the three cusp, and we can measure the by CT even. So we have a uh, correct you know angles, you know. Uh, so uh, during the deployment, uh, especially for Sapiens three, so we prefer you know, straight uh, horizontal line for sinus. Yeah, know? I mean, I think this uh, view right. that we're in right now is right. probably a little bit, it right. became a little more caudal. I think you would have yeah, the, right. the, uh, uh, the tabber valve would be a little more aligned. But would, you, would you take a picture? Uh, are, you, are you, is it more cranial or something? Is it for the, oh, that, that one, right? We didn't, we didn't check this one, right? Yeah. All right. This no, are sorry, no, more cranial, more cranial, sir. All right. Yeah, that's it. Yep. That is there you go. So you guys, you know. It, it, it's okay? So you can see very nicely. I mean, you're right aligned right. on the... So I want to check one more. Do a little cinema, maybe. All yeah, right. So you're perfectly aligned there at the bottom. Uh, angiogram here, and then uh, I want to finish this procedure. That's perfectly okay. aligned. Like, right on. I want to wait one for a while, <laughs> and so it will be more very good. Uh, compensated there. All right. Thank you. Excellent. I owe you. I owe you. <laughs> All right. Dr. 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 Yep. Yeah. Dr. Bach, I'm... I'm Dr. Dr. An, surgeon, Dr. An, here, An. Nice to see you, Dr. Bach. Yes. I have a very simple question about the patient complaint. He, he's, he has uh, some complaint about this uh, relating to CVO AR. I, to I mean, just uh, let me show. I yeah. cannot catch up the uh, dimension of the left ventricle pre op. He has the, some problem, some yeah. complaint about the aortic stenosis or 
Uh, relating to the yeah. uh, aortic regurgitation? Yes, yes of course. The patient uh, suffered patient. from the acute dyspnea related to the aortic regurgitation. The uh, patient was admitted for acute dyspnea right. three weeks ago. So can you show us the uh, dimension dimension of the left ventricle before uh, procedures? Do we have it? I saw that the yeah. your uh, uh, 2D right. echo shows the uh, near yes, normal the, size right. of the left ventricle. Every world size dimension. was about 48, not so large, before mm -hmm. the, the yes. end yes. diastolic <laughs> dimension was about 48. That's so large. That's so large. Yes. Just mean, the, the, uh, professor, uh, the you, you, at 48, right. Yeah. Yes. You mean uh, the uh, event is relatively acute one, sub-acute one? All right, we, we can guess that one. Um, anyway, okay. patients are uh, old age, say, complain of uh, dyspnea and uh, at the admissions in our hospitals, it's a kind of a half failure or something, and so ad administration is the CCU first and then getting yeah. better, and we want to plan this procedure. Yeah, I think this is a pretty typical uh, I remember presentation. Remember that the uh, chest, chest X-ray show ours show the near normal yeah. chest X-ray, uh, yes. no and pulmonary edema, and uh, no cardiomegaly right. at all. For yeah. the live cases, oh. uh, for the live ca live demonstrations, <laughs> he uh, administered for the last, you know, almost uh, one week more. Yes, and uh, getting better as well. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what, is, what is the di your method to targeting the the placement accurate the Position of the, mm -hmm. the sapien three in the valve in valve. You know, right. in the some cases uh, there is uh, some shortening of that. Oh. So how do you measure the to accurate placement of the sapien three in the over the? What is the? How do you targeting? Okay, the David. Uh, David just uh, you know mentioned about the uh, central central. The balloon marker, yeah, yeah, just above the rim. Point is just, ab just above I, there, you know. I think the easiest way Bound. to do it, in the, the easiest way to do it with an S three. Um, is to know the height of the expanded S3 and compare mm. that to the height of the surgical right. valve. Exactly. And then you can determine the top because we know when you expand an S3 valve, the top pretty much stays fixed. Mm -hmm. And so if you position the top correctly, uh, then the bottom, you know, and you know the height. So that's probably the most reliable way. The other way to do it is what, what they did here. We, we would expand this very mm -hmm. slowly um, with All pacing right. and adjust if we needed to a little just, bit. Just uh, as you see the figure, uh, just the final, you know, uh, opposition uh, would be just below the one or two millimeters, yeah. and, you know, depths, uh, you know, uh, after the carpenter would well, previous bell, uh, just the one or two yeah. millimeters. And obviously that's or? also a little bit of an advantage of the right. self-expanding as you can recapture and reposition if you need. Okay. Um, so that's a nice thing. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, David. All right, uh, you want to move a second case? Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, SJ. Thank you, David. Yeah.